Hello everybody, uh, welcome again to the NPTEL online certification course on CMOS uh, digital VLSI design. Uh, in our previous uh, lectures, uh, we have actually understood what is a CMOS inverter, how it works and gives you a digital 1 and 0. We have also seen what is the meaning of propagation delay and noise margin and then how they are related to the device parameters and circuit parameters. Device parameter primarily means the aspect ratio which is W by L and uh, circuit parameters are such, uh, such as uh, uh, your capacitances and so on and so forth. Uh, in our previous lecture, we had actually stopped at the point where we were discussing power dissipation. So, this module will be dedicated to understanding what do you mean by power dissipation and uh, what are the methods available as a designer to actually reduce the power dissipation or optimize the power dissipation. Uh, within the available resources without compromising on its performance analysis. So, let me give to you an idea about uh, what do you mean by energy. So, the whole since it is the whole thing is about power there is no outline slide as such in this case. So, we will be doing first of all what do you understand by power and energy and then we will see for a CMOS inverter how it works out. Well, energy as you know is measured in joules or kilowatt hours and it is the ability of a system to do a work or produce a change, right. So, as I discussed with you that there is no activity, uh, you, you do not have any activity involved and uh, then, then you do not have any power or energy being dissipated, right. So, no activity is possible without energy and this is the bottleneck for any of the inverters because for any inverter to work you need to have switching that will always produce an energy and that energy will be dissipated across the silicon and thereby low, um, making it more getting heated up more and more. Uh, Let us look at uh, the concept of power, well it is measured in watts as I discussed with you it is measured in watts or in kilowatts and it is amount of energy required per unit time, right. So, basically if you are spending larger amount of energy per unit time you are actually dissipating higher power, right. So, uh, as we move along we will see that either you reduce the total energy output energy or you reduce or you make the time frame over which you reduce the power uh, reduce the energy. So, in either of the two cases the power will fall down right. So, that is that is easier said than done, but it is it is how, how it works out. Now, per unit time the average amount of energy consumed is defined as the average power as the as these are simple expressions studied to you from your basic physics and therefore, uh, we have to be very clear that it is the amount of energy which is consumed per unit time is defined as my average power. In most of the cases throughout this lecture as well as in the subsequent lectures, we will be referring to the total power for understanding our purposes. This total power as I discussed with you in the previous uh, lectures, it is basically the sum of or addition of static power, dynamic power as well as leakage power right and or short circuit uh, power. Uh, what do you mean by instantaneous power? Because when T tends to tends to 0, we define that to be as an instantaneous power, which means that for a short pulse of input, if you are consuming a large amount of energy, your instantaneous power will be very high, right. Uh, why is it important? Because in certain cases, in certain interconnects, in certain junctions, if the junction temperature exceeds a particular value even for a very short duration of time, the junction will get uh, will get destroyed, right. And that makes the whole flow of design in a difficult state and the reliability and yield comes under question and therefore, this motivation is required for the study. Uh, let me therefore, come to you the basic definitions and energies as you very well know power is basically defined as voltage into time that means, if, if the voltage drop at that particular point at that particular time multiplied by the current flowing through that as a function of time will be defined as my power. So, power is equals to V into T as I discussed with you. Uh, what do you mean by electrical energy, electrical what is electrical energy? It basically means power into time because power was defined as energy per unit time. So, I get energy equals to power into time and therefore, it was nothing but equals to V t multiplied by I t multiplied by t which you see in front of you here. So, therefore, if a power if an energy is being held for a longer duration of time you get a higher uh, sorry if the power is there for a longer duration of time you get a higher energy being generated out of it right. Well, uh, therefore, from my from understanding this basic concepts of power and the concept of electrical power, uh, you should be aware or you should be you should be aware of the fact that we define a very important term in specially in CMOS circuits that is energy is equals to power into delay. 
which means that in a critical path from primary input to primary output of a digital circuit, if you know what is the power being dissipated and you also know the delay, if you simply multiply the two you get the energy which is as per the definition we learned from here and here. So, therefore, if you want to reduce energy either you have to reduce delay or you have to reduce power. The only problem is the power and delay they do not go they do not get lowered down together or they do not get heightened together. If power is increased power dissipation goes high uh, delay also increases thereby reducing your frequency. Similarly, if you reduce your delay your power dissipation goes high. So, so the problem is that you need to find a solution which will optimize this energy rather than the power itself right and to optimize it you need to optimize the power and you need to optimize the delay individually in order to achieve this result fine. So, with this basic thought process or basic idea uh, we have understood therefore, what do you mean by power and energy uh, as per our definition and uh, let us suppose that you are you connected generally in all our digital electronics or digital uh, VLSI chip design uh, we refer uh, the input power or the, the power supply to be equals to VDD and if nothing is said or it is assumed that that, that the lowest the potential is basically your ground. So, if nothing is said assume that the lowest potential is ground and the highest potential is basically equals to VDD right. So, it is quite interesting the highest potential in a chip will be equals to VDD and the lowest potential lowest potential will be equals to ground right. It can be also a negative value right it can be also less than 0 can be also one of the lowest potential available to you. But typically this is the uh, values which you see and this is known as power rail and this is known as the ground rail. So, whenever you draw a circuitry this is basically your power power rail right and this is your ground rail which you see and between these two rails you will all have your circuits available here right and these are power rails will be added the ground rail will be added like this and there will be power rails like this. So, this will be the general structure of any system design or basic combinational logic design right. With this knowledge the instantaneous power as I discussed with you will be equals to this much which is nothing but the current flowing at that particular time t at which you are actually trying to measure the instantaneous power multiplied by VDD where VDD is the applied voltage uh, uh, at, at that particular point. We define energy as if you remember energy was nothing but if you integrate the power in time domain from 0 to t right that is basically your energy. So, what I do is I take PT dt and integrate from 0 to t and I what I get from here is IDD VDD into 0 to t right where 0 is the point at which the current starts to flow and the capital T is the time at which you do have a uh, uh, stoppage of current which means that the current becomes a function of time t and therefore, the energy is dissipated per unit time might vary but the total energy will still remain the same that is what you can see from here right. Let us discuss what is known as the average power right average power average power is energy divided by the total time t right and that is what you see. So, the same expression which you see here this expression divided by capital T is my average power right. But for most cases in the whole uh, logic design which we will study or the combination logic design we when we talk of power we talk of total power right. Uh, a transient when we do a transient analysis uh, we talk about let us say we do a transient analysis then when we do a transient a transient. So, if you remember there are two three analysis as I discussed with you in the earlier cases we have a DC analysis we have a transient analysis analysis right. What is DC analysis? DC analysis when you have a DC bias and you want to find out the voltage current under DC bias. What is AC? When your input is an AC cycle and so for example, A sin omega t. What is a transient? When you give an impulse or you give a delta function something like this right and because of this you will have a function of time t available to you. So, in most of the cases whenever we are doing DC analysis we talk of total power available to us. When we talk of AC analysis or when the value is changing or the, or the value of your system in fact, if you are doing for example, a uh, uh, not, not you are not giving a pulse, but you are giving a input signal which is sinusoidal in nature then we will discuss AC and then you will if you are giving a pulse you will be doing a transient analysis. Now, so that is the reason the average power is given by E by T in this cases. Let me give you a brief idea about what is the, the, the formula here. Now, if you remember in our previous discussion we had seen that this was my PMOS right this was my PMOS right and this was my NMOS and I had a load capacitance here C L. Assume it, so and this is your VDD line 
and this is your ground. So, this is your ground uh, which is earth right this is your ground and you have got assume this power line to be having a large amount of water sort of a glass with the water in it right. And what I do I give in the input side right a 1 to 0 transition. So, this is 1 this is 0. So, I do a 1 to 0 transition with a finite fall time available to me. So, I have a finite fall time finite T f which is fall time. Fall time is defined as the difference or the time taken for the signal to go from 90 percent of its highest value to 10 percent of its highest value right. So, if you are if you are looking at this as VDD then 0 0.9 VDD to approximately 0 0.1 VDD is basically the time taken to do this is basically your TF or TF. So, I have a particular TF available to me because of this TF there is a 1 to 0 transition and therefore, I would expect to see by my earlier discussion a 0 to 1 transition which is basically a 0 to VDD transition right and there will be also a TF attached to it or TR in this case it will be TR 10 percent of VDD to 90 percent of VDD difference is defined as my rise time. So, I have a rise time here. Now, let us see what happens. Uh, so, let me give you an idea. So, voltage is sort of a water pressure. So, higher the water pressure more will be the voltage. A current is basically the water quantity flowing per unit time as I discussed with you and the energy is the total amount of water flowing right. So, let us see if I do a small thing that I this is what will happen right that your water will in the first half cycle when 1 to 0 when you are going 1 to 0 what was happening in 1 NMOS was on right. Now, when you go to 0 PMOS gets on. So, when NMOS was on your capacitor was fully discharged because it was connected to the ground and all charge of the capacitor was moving to the ground. Now, when you go from 1 to 0 NMOS switches off and PMOS goes to, uh, to a resistive state right resistive state. Once this happen voltage from VDD line starts to charge C L in this path as I discussed in the earlier sense which means that whenever you have a 1 to 0 transition in the output there will be energy drawn from VDD and stored where in the C L in the capacitive block here is it clear. So, how much do you store C V D D square is the amount of energy you store right energy consumed therefore, is directly proportional to the capacitive load that is very simple and straightforward. Why? Because higher the capacitive load more time it will take by the same amount of current to charge it fully or to bring it to a v value equals to VDD. So, if your capacitance is lowered you can safely think that the amount of time taken to bring it to the highest value which is VDD will be lowered and therefore, your energy consumption will be lower right. But let us suppose that is the energy consumption which you see. Let me see what I will happen if I do a 1 to 0 transition right. If I do a 1 to 0 transition during 1 your NMOS was on right uh, your sorry your NMOS yes your NMOS was basically on and when you go to higher value PMOS gets on in that case right. When PMOS gets on this gets charged. So, what was happening in the previous case I will explain to you what happens in the previous case. Uh, in the previous case uh, initially 1 NMOS was on right. Uh, if you look very closely here NMOS was on this is the initial case there was there was no water here. Now, what I do I go from 1 to 0 this allows my PMOS to goes on right and it charges this capacitance to this and therefore, this starts to fill up right. Now, we have discussed the energy therefore, is proportional to the capacitive load. Now, if I take a 1 to 0 transition first of all initially it was suppose the, this is fully charged now once it is fully charged and I go from again I make it 1 then what will happen is this will at this instant this will discharge across this path agreed. Why initially it was 0 and going to 1 as it goes to 1 NMOS switches on and all the charge stored here actually goes to this pitch and how much it is half C V D D square will go, 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 go in this case right. So, this is what you get that means whenever you go from output goes. So, the output goes from 1 to 0 your capacitor starts to discharge and therefore, energy is consumed only at 0 to 1 output. I think I am clear to you why, why is it like that. Energy is only consumed when you have a 0 to 1 transition in the output side because 0 to 1 transition in the output corresponds to PMOS getting on and you are consuming energy from the power rail and you are storing it in the capacitor. 
where are you dissipating energy when you are discharging the charge in the capacitor through the n mos structure when output is going from zero, uh, 1 to 0. So, let me say like this it this happens this is very straightforward and simple way of looking at it that if let us suppose your W by L ratio of this one P mos was higher as compared to the W by L ratio of this one. So, let us suppose this is W by L ratio 2 and this is 1 and W by L of 1 is greater than 2 then you can safely assume that the current flowing through this circuitry will be this circuitry will be larger as compared to the current flowing through the circuitry. Therefore, this will be filling up faster as compared to this and therefore, the rise time here will be much much smaller as compared to this. Am I clear? I will explain you once again what do I mean to say. If I improve or if I make my aspect ratio of this W by L of the of the pull up PMOS to be higher, it implies that the current flowing through PMOS will also be larger as compared to the current flowing through this PMOS and as a result the amount of time taken to charge the same value of C L will be smaller in case of the first case which is this one and it will be higher in case of second one and therefore, the rise time will be faster in the case of the first one right and therefore, your rise times are larger right. So, therefore, it is fast rise this is a slow rise right and therefore, inverter 1 is the faster this is faster inverter. So, how did I receive a faster inverter by making my PMOS larger device as compared to the second inverter PMOS as a result, but you understand I am still using the same amount of energy. Why the same amount of energy because C L in both the cases are exactly the same my V D D is exactly the same. What I am trying to do is within the same amount of time I am able to achieve the values in the output side in a much more better manner. So, therefore, I get much high instantaneous power in inverter 1, but I get a low instantaneous power in 2. Why? Because it is very simple in the second case though your energies are same, but the time taken to relieve that much amount of energy is larger. Therefore, P by T which is P is actually much lower in the second case. How did I do that? Very simple simply make the aspect ratio of your pull up transistor higher. I leave as an exercise to you to please find out what will happen if your pull down transistor pull down transistor which is basically your NMOS width was higher just think about it right just think about it what will happen if the pull down widths are higher in this case fine and you should not be able to answer this question very easily once you know the relative strengths of PMOS and NMOS in charging and discharging the uh, capacitor. Let me come to the therefore, the matrix here and uh, the first approach is something like this if you come back here and I will I will just explain to you what do you mean by that. Now, you see as I discussed in the previous discussion if you plot power versus time here right in the first case it, so power versus time. So, P into T will be equals to E right and therefore, you see so if your power has been made higher, but your T is smaller here which is inverter one case one case in the inverter 2 case the power is smaller, but the time domain is larger, but the area under the curve which is P into T is same in both the cases. So, the energy consumed is exactly the same, but second one is consuming or having a lower instantaneous power as compared to the first one right. So, what I am trying to tell you is that by simply changing the aspect ratio you can actually have a lower uh, power available to you by simply manipulating certain things within the system. So, this is what I wanted to discuss with you in this case and now therefore, we define as I discussed with you it is power into delay which you just now found out because this is the power. So, this is basically your power here right this is your, this is your power here and this is the amount time delay 0 to 1 transition which is taking place right 10 percent to 90 percent of the VDD is the time taken here that multiplied by P will give you the energy and this much energy was doing what? is being absorbed by the device in this case the capacitance from where from VDD from the power rail. So, let me therefore, come back to the initial understanding or initial slide slide mechanisms here and the mechanism is therefore, that during the first half cycle when the input is going from high to low right. Then you are allowing the capacitor to get charged and you are drawing in energy equals to C V D D square during the next half cycle you are releasing it by half C V D D square and therefore, for each cycle of propagation half C V D D square is the amount of energy which you are actually dissipating to the environment right is it ok fine. 
With this knowledge, let us move forward and explain to you. We have discussed power and energy. We have also discussed that power energy is equal to power into delay. And uh, let me therefore uh, give you an idea about some imp basic issues, and we can then move forward. Why why energy dissipation is important? Because lower the energy dissipation, lower higher will be your battery life. Uh, typically, uh, very important is today's all your handheld devices, all your. Uh, uh, PDAs, uh, your digital logic should have very, very low energy dissipation. So, therefore, it sets the packaging limits also because there are certain issues which uh, the, the if the amount of energy is releasing is high, there are certain packaging issues which will limit its uh, energy high because at the end of the day, uh, you want this uh, energy to dissipate in the atmosphere, right. So, it can only happen by either a convection or conduction, right. So, when conduction is there, the material you use for packaging interconnects will also play a major role in determining how much amount of energy you are dissipating to the atmosphere or to the ambient. Peak power actually makes the, our life difficult, but we will not be concentrating on this too much. But uh, this impacts your signal noise margin and it also imp implies your reliability. So, if your peak power is higher, your average power might be low, right? which means that you are working say at 1 watt for about 50 days, but suddenly one day for very few seconds of time you went to 50 watts. Right? Then the amount of energy you consume in that period is exactly equals to what you have consumed for last 30 days. And as a result, you might have a sudden drainage of the battery and therefore, there will be a reliability issue or even the junction temperatures go high and may destroy the junctions uh, temperatures and so on and so forth. So, you have to be very careful about what energy we are using and why we are using those energies. Right? Uh, an important criteria therefore, we define one important product which is again energy here is what is known as a power delay product PDP. So, we always find try to find out the power delay product. We also try to find out another important quantity and that is known as energy delay product which is nothing but PDP into TP, TP is the propagation delay and therefore, it is nothing but P into TP square. Which means if you look very carefully uh, in within EDP right EDP is therefore, proportional to TP square right. right? Which means that the propagation delay has got a higher stake in determining your EDP. So, if you are able to reduce your TP propagation delay by half, you will be able to lower your EDP by one fourth that is the bottom line right. Whereas, PDP can be only halved energy can be actually made one fourth right. And therefore, two designs which is given here can have the same PDP right, can have the same PDP. Why? Because one design can have a very high power, but low TP. Another design can have very low power, but very high TP. In either two cases, the PDP remains constant for both the cases. So, this is one of the methods uh, uh, available to us. This we have discussed in our previous uh, lectures also that is basically your um, uh, this is dynamic power. So, uh, the power which 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 you which has been taken from the VDD rail right, the power which you have taken from there, where, where does it go actually? Yes, the power goes in three important uh, consumptions, the, it is consumed as dynamic power right. As I discussed, we have short circuit uh, currents, we have leakage currents right. The dynamic power is by virtue of charging, repeated charging and discharging of capacitors. A short circuit is when you have uh, between supply rail and ground, if you switch back and forth, you will have short circuit. Right, and that I just discuss later on maybe and I have also discussed in the previous uh, discussion and leakage is when even when a transistor is off as I discussed with you uh, in the previous discussion, you will always have some off currents available to you right. These are known as leakage currents. So, all these contribute to the total power in a CMOS inverter. Let me explain to you what do I mean by dynamic power right. Dynamic power is nothing but the power consumed by the inverter by virtue of constant switching between a high and low state in the output side. Because every time you go from high to low and vice versa, you are actually charging or discharging your capacitor respectively. right? So, every time you charge a capacitor, you store half CVDD square. Every time you discharge a capacitor, you also discharge half CVDD square right? and that is how you work out. So, to give you a brief idea how it works out, when VDD through VDD rail, when you try to have a current flow taking place and charging your CL right, half CL VDD square is the amount of energy stored in the capacitor right and the amount of energy given by the VDD rail is CVDD square. So, half CVDD square again is dissipated through PMOS in that case. So, we define dynamic power as CL times VDD square 
right multiplied by p 0 to 1 into f I will explain to you what this term is. See 0 to 1 transition right is the only power consuming transition right. So, which which transition 0 to 1 0 to 1 in the output side why I, I explained to you earlier also. So, 0 to 1 in the output primarily means 1 to 0 in the input. Now, 1 to 0 primarily means that your n mass was initially on now you are switching on the p mass. So, when you are switching on the p mass you are actually consuming a current or you are actually getting current from V d d and you are charging the value of C l here. This is basically the probability for a 0 to 1 switch of output you understand why because whenever you will have a 0 to 1 switch in the output side that is the time when the capacitor is getting charged by virtue of a connection between V d d and the output side and this voltage therefore raises to V d d right. So, that is the reason I multiply with probability p 0 to 1 and therefore, also I multiply with frequency of operation because then I will very well know that means, in the 10 clock cycles if there are 10 p 0 to 1 the probability is 1 and therefore, what you will see is that the power dissipation will go up. So, what you get from here is that the probability the probability that it is p 0 to 1 to into f is basically the probability that it is a power consuming cycle and the power consuming cycle will take care of it one or the, the, the overall system. We define a very important term here this uh, factor uh, p 0 to 1 p 0 to 1 uh, into f which is the frequency of operation as f of 0 to 1 which is that value of that many number of transitions from 0 to 1 which will be always a power consuming transition right and it is also defined as activity factor multiplied by f. I will explain activity factor just now to you and maybe uh, maybe in the next slide I will explain to you, but what is activity factor what is that I will explain to you right. So, the final expression is basically C l V d d square multiplied by alpha into, into f right where f is the frequency of operation. So, I have got C l I have got V d d square I have got alpha and I have got f, f, f is the activity factor, f is the frequency of operation, C l is the load capacitance and V d d is the power rail voltage available to you. So, uh, therefore, quite an interesting uh, observation out of all this discussion is that the switching activity the function of switching activity is data dependent. So, if your data is for example, uh, let us suppose it is 0 1 then 0 1 something like this right and if it is 0 0 0 1 right how many number of 0 to 1 transitions in the output side 1 2 and how many here only 1. So, in a cycle of 4 clock cycles I will have 2 transitions which are power consuming whereas, only 1 in the second case. So, am I clear? So, the, 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 the idea is that the, I told to you 0 to 1 in the output is my power consuming cycle. So, let us suppose I have I have a output data which is 0 0 0 1 uh, in flow 4 clock cycles or 4 times it has come and I have another case which is 0 to 1 and it is 0 to 1. Then you see this case you have only 1 transition of 0 to 1 whereas, in this case you have 1 transition and 2 transitions. So, 1 and 1 and only 1 here. So, obviously, this will be more power consuming as, as compared to this. So, switching activity is therefore, data dependent what type of data you are getting is basically dependent on the switching activity depends upon that data uh, to a larger extent. But let us suppose that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 clock cycles. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 clock cycles are there and in the output side let me say because of some reason because of some complexity you have say like this 1, 2, 3 so on and so forth. So, there are 8 clock cycles 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8 and how many 0 to 1 transitions 1, 2, 3 then we define the activity factor to be equals to 3 by 8 which means that activity the maximum activity factor is 1 which is of clock because in clock for every clock cycle you will have at least one 0 to 1 transition available to you and therefore, alpha for clock is always equals to 1, but alpha for some other combinational logical block for other thing might be like this and therefore, there might be only 3 or 4 let us suppose something like this that you had out of this you had 1 right and then 2 let us say 3 and let us suppose 4. So, I have got 0 to 1 here, 0 to 1 here, 
I have 0 to 1 here and 0 to 1 here. So, in the 8 clock cycle pulses, I have 4 0 to 1 transition. So, 4 by 8 is alpha, which is nothing but 0 0.5. So, 8 times the clock have passed, only I get 0 0.5. So, what I do, my power dissipation, dynamic power dissipation is 0 0.5 into this thing. And the reason you can understand why is it like that, right? but it can be also high made higher and higher fine. So, this is the basic idea which I wanted to discuss in this case. Uh, we will be therefore, uh, discussing about short circuit power dissipation in the next class. Thank you very much.